first of all, welcome to the Legal Services of New Jersey, Melville D. Miller Jr. Justice Series. Uh, today's topic is bias and discrimination in New Jersey. Uh, we welcome you to have you here. I'm going to turn it over to Don Miller, our president of Ellison J, for some introductory remarks. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Dawn Miller, President of Legal Services of New Jersey. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, join us this Wednesday afternoon. There are over 600 people registered and wow. nearly all of you uh, are already on. So thank you very much. We expect this to be uh, a, a great uh, afternoon learning session. Today's event is part of Ellis and Jay's ongoing new initiative, the Melville D. Miller Jr. Justice Series, named in honor of our co-founder and president, D. Miller. The series uh, focuses on topics relating to social and racial justice. And today's panel will explore trends and factors in the recent uptick in reported bias incidents in New Jersey. I am pleased to introduce to you our moderator for today, Akil Roper, who is Senior Vice President at LSNJ. Uh, he put this panel together and we wanna welcome Akil. Thank you all again for joining us. Akil, over to you. Thank you very much, Dawn. It is my honor and pleasure to be able to introduce the this panel today. Um, we're very lucky to have them with us. As Dawn mentioned, this program is part of our ongoing justice series named after our late founder, Dee Miller. And it was part of Dee's vision to increase awareness and raise issues of injustice and discrimination throughout the state and the nation. And he, he did it well. And we're trying to carry on that tradition. Uh, so our most recent virtual installment of the justice series explored reparations for black Americans and racism in the child welfare system. Uh, but today we have invited speakers to share their perspectives on discrimination and bias in New Jersey, uh, including the recent reporting of bias and its community impact, potential solutions, the historic work of the NAACP, and the use of data and what the future may hold. Uh, as we explore these concepts, the intent is to spark thoughts about how better we treat each other. Uh, the impact of discrimination and bias, particularly for low income and communities of color, and how to overcome. As a legal services system, we are charged with helping those who don't have equal access to necessary resources to help secure justice. And part of that mission is promoting awareness and understanding. And as we will hear, discrimination and bias refer to unjust, unfair, or prejudicial treatment of people because of their differences, including around race, around gender, sexual preferences, uh, or other groupings. Uh, and in the context of a crime, bias refers to acts fully or partially motivated by bias against a person or group. Uh, discrimination and bias are distinct concepts, but with a common core. And when you boil these concepts down, it's clear that we need a response, a remedy, uh, because in their application, discrimination and bias erodes the fabric of communities and should have no place in our society. And with that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. First, we have Erin Williams, who I know through her work uh, from the Division on Civil, uh, Civil Rights. I'm proud to consider her a partner in that work with DCR. Uh, Ms. Williams is an experienced and versatile attorney who works to champion the principles of equity, justice, and opportunity over civility and respectability. She is barred in New Jersey, New York, and the Southern District of New York, but has appeared in various courts around the country. She is an experienced civil rights litigator, social, racial, and reproductive justice movement lawyer, and proud criminal defense attorney. Aaron is proudly the Interim Chief of Strategic Initiatives and Enforcement for the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, where she manages a team who proactively promote initiatives aimed at preventing and eradicating discrimination, bias, and hate in New Jersey by drafting statutory amendments and regulations, issuing reports to raise the profile of civil rights issues, drafting legal guidance documents, and undertaking director-initiated investigations into possible patterns and practices of discrimination. Prior to DCR, Aaron worked as a reproductive justice and criminal defense lawyer with a national nonprofit advocating for and representing pregnant people who were charged with crimes or faced punishment in relation to their pregnancy. In her role, she provided legal advice, engaged in impact litigation, direct representation, coalition building, developing case strategies and work to shift culture around drug policy, 
boldly, bodily autonomy, pardon, and state sanctioned violence and developed the legal and public education on various issues. For nearly a decade prior, Aaron was a zealous trial attorney as a New Jersey State Public Defender where she was a trial strategy trainer and led lawyer handling complex felony criminal cases. Aaron is originally from Georgia, a graduate of Howard University and Rutgers School of Law of Newark, where she was a member of the Rutgers Law Review and is an and adjunct professor at Seton Hall Law School. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, sorry for being tardy. No problem, not at all. I'll continue to provide an introduction to the rest of our panel, and then we will turn it over to Aaron. Um, but for, I also wanted to introduce Reggie Johnson, and I've known Reggie for some time in his various yeah. leadership op capacities, and he's proven time and time again that he is a deep concern for people. Um, Reggie is an agent for the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office, and before joining the Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office, Mr. Johnson was the project coordinator for the Union County Prosecutor's Office and the director of programming for the National Conference for Community and Justice, a human relations organization. Mr. Johnson is currently the president of the Metuchen Edison branch of the NAACP, where he serves as chairman of the Middlesex County Cultural and Cultural, pardon me, Heritage Commission. Mr. Johnson has also co-founded the Middlesex County Human Relations Commission. This is an organization formed to address the growth of bias related incidents in the county and to develop commissions in each of the 25 municipalities. Additionally, he co-founded the Middlesex County Alliance for Justice, an assembly of activist grassroots organizations whose purpose was to focus on domestic needs in this country, which included housing, education, employment, drug prevention and treatment centers, affirmative action and investigation on police brutality grievances. In 1994, Mr. Johnson was selected by Superior Court Judge Robert Longy to chair the Middlesex County Vicinage Advisory Committee on Minority Concerns. This committee reviews the mission and mandate of the Standing Supreme Court Committee on Minority Concerns. During Mr. Johnson's lifetime, he has been awarded the Thomas E. Culp Senior Exceptional Leadership Award from the New Jersey Bias Crime Office Officers Association and various other awards and accolades. Um, and last but not least, we have Shivi Prasad. Uh, her work is legendary in this area and I'm honored to be able to work with her. She is the director of Ellison J's Poverty Research Institute. She holds a master's degree in public administration with specialization in public policy from New York University's Wagner School of Public Service. She has been with Ellison J since 2006. And as part of PRI, she has worked on many qualitative and quantitative studies affecting the lives of New Jerseyans living in poverty. She has about 20 years experience in the field of public policy. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. Those introductions um, needed to be said uh, because the folks on this panel are, are quite, um, quite accomplished. And I, we're, I hope to get uh, a lot from this conversation and, and hope to, to kick it off. So I'll turn it over to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Akil. Thank you so much, Ellis and Jay family and everyone who's here, whom, because we are in presentation mode, I cannot see, but I'm glad you're here to learn about all of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, Akil, do you, can you bring up my PowerPoint? I got or, it. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. You can go right on to the second slide. As was mentioned, thank you, Kelly. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, my name is Erin Williams. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am with the, um, the Division of Civil Rights. And for those who may not know, because I don't presume that everyone does, DCR is a state agency, which is part of the Attorney General's Office that enforces through investigations, regulations, and prosecutions, the law against discrimination, referred to as the LAD, the New Jersey Family Leave Act, which you may hear referred to as NJFLA or FLA, and beginning in this year, January 2022, the Fair Chance and Housing Act, which, you, which we refer to as the FCHA. A lot of acronyms, I know. I will spend most of my presentation referring to the LAD because it is arguably the most expansive anti-discrimination law in the country and certainly one of the oldest. But I want to provide a very brief overview of the other important laws that we enforce because I think they're sometimes overlooked and again are really helpful for people to know about. 
So briefly, under the New Jersey Family Leave Act or the FLA, um, which is different than FMLA, a person or persons who work for a state or local government agency or a company or organization with 30 or more employees worldwide and who has been employed by the company for at least one year has, and has worked at least a thousand hours um, can generally take up to 12 weeks of job protected leave during any, during any 24 month period under a range of very common circumstances. It's a right that you have in our state. It's not common everywhere. And so I like to tell people about that. And then you have the Fair Chance in Housing Act, which bars housing providers from asking about criminal history on housing applications in most instances. Um, the FCHA is the first law of its kind in the country and is intended to ensure people with past criminal histories have a fair shot at accessing um, safe and affordable housing. But to the heart of what we're also talking about. Um, so two broad ways that we at DCR will work toward fulfilling our mission to eliminate and prevent discrimination in New Jersey is through our reactive work and our proactive work. Our reactive work makes us we're mandated to serve as neutral investigators to take complaints from individuals who are alleging discrimination and harassment, um, investigate those to determine if there is indeed a violation of the law against discrimination, the FLA or FCHA, and determine if we are able to remediate violations in many ways. And that's achieved through two different units, investigations and legal. And then we have our proactive work, which I'm, I'm um, honored to lead one of those units. Um, and our proactive work, we, instead of reacting to individual complaints, we work to prevent discrimination and address more systemic issues that can't necessarily be addressed by individual complaints. And that is achieved through our community relations unit, which is a, a unit that goes out into the community and works to build relations so that you all can feel safe um, and feel like you can trust DCR to file, to receive your complaints and handle them. We have an education and training unit, which does education and training diversity, equity, inclusion. They did one today on LGBTQIA plus issues in schools. Um, and sometimes the, the people you can sign up for them on our website or some entities are actually required to if they are found to have violated the law, they're required to actually participate in those on a regular basis. And then we have the strategic initiatives and enforcement unit, which I am proud to lead where we proactively address um, discrimination, bias and hate through um, looking for things to investigate for entities to possibly to investigate their violations that can come th to us through the public, that can come to us through policy reports, like, like Ellis and Jay may issue, that may come to us through media, including social media. We also work on regulations and, and laws. So um, our unit diligent, our unit, my unit, <laughs> diligently works to radically steer DCR and New Jersey towards justice. And we do that with an um, intersectional approach. We address discrimination through regulations and legislation and investigations and much, much more. So I think you can move on to the next slide, Kelly. Thank you. I want to be mindful of my colleagues' time as well. Thank you. So the LED prohibits discrimination and harassment based on race and color, religion and creed, national origin, nationality, and ancestry, gender or sex, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, marital status, civil union status or domestic, uh, I think it's cut off, but I believe that's domestic partnership at the bottom, disability, pregnancy, breastfeeding and chest feeding, liability for service in the U.S. military, and in some cases, family status, age, genetic information, or lawful source of income. And we, those are part of the reason why the LED is so expansive is because um, of these protected characteristics here that a lot of states frankly do not um, cover and the federal government certainly does not cover. So the LED, I see a question is the law against discrimination. And again, that is specific to New Jersey. And so we protect all of those characteristics um, in employment and in housing and places open to the public and places of public accommodation where those that are open to the public include, but are not limited to public um, schools, frankly, even sometimes on different levels, private schools, um, healthcare facilities, stores, restaurants, pharmacies, jails, prison and policing, credit and contracting and the like. And that's again, what makes us so expansive is that we cover so much in the state, both under the characteristics that are protected and the places in which you are protected. Next slide, please. 
So, but you're here also to talk about bias incidents. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the meat of the discussion, um, the incredible rise in bias incidents around our state and our nation. So let's start with what a bias incident is. Bias incidents are suspected or confirmed offenses that are committed because of the victim's perceived or actual race, color, religion, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, national origin or ethnicity and age. These can be both civil offenses as well as criminal offenses. And while they may be handled both civilly and if they're handled civilly, that can be handled certainly by DCR, but an example of a civil offense could also be something where you report it to your HR department or you may report um, some discrimination or bias that you may experience to a medical provider. Um, those are non-criminal if you decide to proceed in those ways. Um, and then of course, there's a criminal way that you can enforce a bias incident and that is through like law enforcement by calling the police, for example. We at DCR strongly encourage you and everyone to at least attempt to file a complaint with DCR, even if or when you provide, um, even when you may file your complaint of bias, hate, or discrimination with other agencies, because unlike most reporting processes, whether it's through your HR department or filing through, as, a, as an example, the a store that you may have felt that you were discriminated against, unlike reporting in those contexts, our specific purpose, our jurisdiction allows us and functions to provide a person with relief if we believe that they have in fact been discriminated against. So again, we're a neutral party, but we work to ensure and lean towards trying to provide as much um, relief to people who have been violated. So again, if you feel as if, you know, I already filed a complaint um, with um, my law enforcement agency because I feel as if I was discriminated or treated some type of bias incident, you can certainly still file with DCR and we can work to get some monetary damages, some specific performance, restitution, and even equitable relief. So over the past five years or so, DCR through the unit that I'm currently um, leading, we have released four reports. Those you see on the screen right here, addressing the rise in bias incidents across the state and providing some recommendations on how to address these issues. I'm going to go over some of this information in more detail over the next few slides, but I wanted to note at the outset that given that bias incidents often go unreported, these numbers likely represent only a small fraction of the incidents involving New Jersey's young people. Over the past, we began to increase efforts um, and processes to make sure it's easier to report bias incidents, and that surely is attributed to how there is a rise, but I don't want to mark that as the only reason. It is just, in fact, um, it is an unfortunate fact that bias incidents are a rise, um, or on the rise and are increasing. So our belief is also that there is still an underreporting effect of these incidents as we continue to work to spread awareness of the increase. Can you please move to the next slide? Thank you. So I'm gonna go through some of those reports. We did one in 2017 and 18, one in 2019, one in, in two in 2012, two about the rise in bias incidents in 2020. One was our Youth Bias Task Force Report one, and one was our most recent one that we released this year about bias incidents, um, including but not exclusive of um, youth bias. So our very first one for 2017 and 2018, um, we noted based upon data provided to the New Jersey State Police that there was a 32% increase in the number of reported bias incidents in New Jersey. Um, from 417 in 2016 to 549 in 2017. It doesn't sound like a lot, but again, if you consider the fact that those are just the ones that are being reported, um, it's alarming still to think about the number of, the, of that drastic increase. And notably, this was the largest jump since at least 2006. So there was an additional 4% increase from 2017 to 2018. And the 569 reported bias incidents in 2018 were the highest total number since 2011. So as you can see on the screen, bias incidents motivated by race or ethnicity accounted for 52% in 2017 and 54% in 2018. That's documented in that, those pie charts. Religion, religious discrimination and bias incidents what represented 38% in 2017 and 35% in 2018. Gender and sexual orientation 
represented 10% in 2017 and was unchanged in 2018. And disability discrimination represented 1% in 2017 and was unchanged in 2018. So often people ask, where is this happening? So in 2017, the majority of counties in New Jersey experienced an increase in reported bias incidents from 2016 to 17. Burlington, Bergen, and Cape May counties reported the largest percentage increases. Each county reported an increase of over 100% in reported bias incidents from 2016 to 2017. And from 2017 to 2018, nine counties experienced a decrease in reported bias incidents. Nine counties experienced an increase and three counties stayed the same. So Union and Passaic counties experienced the largest increase in reported bias incidents from 2017 to 18, and both counties experienced a greater than 100% increase. And Morris County also experienced a significant increase from 31% reported bias incidents in 2017 to 52%, 52 reported, excuse me, bias incidents in 2018, which represented a 68% increase. So as for the highest rate of incidents in 2017, the counties with more than one reported bias incident per 10,000 residents were Gloucester, Monmouth, Middlesex, Burlington, and Mercer. And in 2018, the counties with more than one reported bias incident per 10,000 residents were Monmouth, Burlington, and Morris counties. So we have some work to do. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in 2019, there were 994 total reported bias incidents in New Jersey. That is that there were 994 acts reported to local law enforcement and reported by law enforcement to the state. So those are multiple levers, levels, excuse me, people have to report it. And then the state has to report, excuse me, law enforcement actually has to report it to the state for us to use these numbers. This should, that should be accurate. Um, but I just like to note those different levels so that we can, again, can consider that I so firmly believe in DCR believes that this is still underreporting of what is actually happening in our state, and yet still it's alarming. So, um, I'm sorry, there were 994 acts reported to law enforcement um, and reported by local law enforcement to the state as having been committed because of the victim's actual race or religion or gender orientation or disability, all those protected characteristics that I named before. So this represents, again, an alarming 75% increase over the 569 total reported bias incidents in 2018, which itself comes after already a 32% increase in the number of reported incidents from 2016 to 17, and another 4% increase from 2017 to 2018. So we are just yet again, ticking further and further up in our percentages of how we are increasing across the state in bias incidents. In 2019, Black people were once again the most frequent targets of racially motivated bias incidents. Overall, anti-Black racism was the motivation for a reported bias incident 371 times, accounting for 30% of all reported motivations in 2019. Also consistent with historical trends, Jewish people remain the religious group most frequently targeted and reported for bias incidents in 2019. Specifically, anti-Jewish bias was the reported motivation for bias incidents 345 times in 2019, accounting for 28% of all reported motivations in that year. Um, reported bias incidents have been rising since 2015. From 2015 to 2019, there was a 171% increase in reported bias incidents in our state of New Jersey. Anti-Hispanic or Latinx, there was 14% bias increase, was the most com was 14% more likely to be the most commonly reported motivation for um, ethnicity and anti-Hispanic or Latinx bias was the motivation for a reported bias incident 48 times. Thank you. Um, can you thank you, perfect timing. Now we get to the infamous and incredibly meaningful year of 2020. In October, 2020, we released what we refer to as, as I mentioned before, the Youth Bias Task Force Report. Um, all of our reports can be found on our website. And when I'm not presenting, I will make sure I drop those in the chat if I'm able to do so, um, or links to the reports. Um, we released that report, which specifically focused on the alarming rise in youth bias incidents. According to our 2017-2018 bias incident report, New Jersey's children and young adults accounted for 53% of known offenders of bias incidents in 2018. 
and 45% of victims of such bias incidents. And in 2019, 25% of all reported bias incidents occurred in K through 12 schools. As a result, um, Governor Murphy convened a task force led by DCR to address this rise in incidents. And that task force provided 27 recommendations for various agencies, including DCR, DOE, um, and others. And based upon its recommendations, we, we developed our rec recommendations after examining institutional bias, systemic bias, and particularly systemic racism as part of the formulating recommendations to address interpersonal bias. So 2020 now marks the highest annual number of reported bias incidents in New Jersey since the state began reporting bias incidents in 1994. In 2020, we, New Jersey, saw a total of 1,447 reported bias incidents, a 45% increase from 2019's record high of 994. And remember, we've just been continuing to build and build and build. Well, maybe I should be saying in the opposite way. <laughs> we are continuing to, I think, destroy and destroy and destroy, really. Um, but we've been building on those numbers. So this is particularly striking concern that many people were quarantining for most of 2020, or at least should have been, and we're having less in-person interaction at work, in schools, and stores, et cetera. So our report discusses the data, trends, and causes we believe contribute to the rise in bias incidents. We specifically attribute the upward trend that this year, that year of 2020, to the COVID-19 pandemic, racist backlash against Black Lives Matter protests, and the presidential election. There are very large increases in reported race-motivated incidents, which includes an 85% increase in number of times anti-Black racism was reported, um, was a reported motivation for a bias incident, and, and has been the case since 2006. Anti-Black incidents were most frequently a reported motivation. Then there was a 77% increase in anti-Asian racism and as a motivation for bias incidents, often related to COVID including calling it the Chinese virus, fueled by a narrative that China, that China was responsible for the pandemic. And race, ethnicity, or ancestry accounted for 62%, or 1,094 of the 17, 1,764 reported motivations. And that included anti-Hispanic or Latinx bias commonly reported for ethnically motivated incidents. So we, of course, saw incidents motivated by other types of bias and hate too, Unfortunately, religion in 2020 accounted for 22% of motivations with Jewish people being religious, uh, being the religious group most frequently targeted based upon reporting. Gender, which includes sex, gender identity, gender expression, and transgender status, or sexual orientation accounted for 15% in 2020. And anti-gay bias being most frequently reported motivation for sexual orientation-based incidents and anti-transgender bias most commonly reported motivation for incidents motivated by gender, a 70% increase. So, oh, excuse me, let me finish that thought. A 70% increase in, tw in 2020 of anti-trans motivations, 70%. So physical or mental disability of the victim accounts for slightly less than 1% or 16 through the low numbers may reflect the barriers people with disabilities face to report and affect, um, also an effect of the pandemic. So importantly, like prior reports, we also collected info on people who committed the bias incidents. So I didn't do that in this entire presentation because so I'm sure I'm running out of time. But each report we do not only document who is reporting these, but also who is alleged to have um, been the folks committing the bias incidents and the types of offenses. So in 2020, almost 70% of offenders were adults, almost 80% were men, while over 80% of offenders were white, with 12% being black, 3.5% Asian, and fewer were Pacific, and, and, and even fewer were Pacific Islander and multiple races. For all groups except white men, their percentage in offenses was lower than their statewide population. So for white men, they were overrepresented in bias incidents or committing bias incidents. This has also been a trend since we've been recording this data. So we made sure to include data broken out by county also. That's a larger picture at the top. And um, because again, every time I talk about this work, people always rightfully want to know where is this happening. Is it happening in my neighborhood? Is it happening to my children? And candidly, I think the answer is yes. We should all assume that it is happening 
even if you're, if, when you look at these charts, it may not be fully represented as well. Um, again, because there are a number of systemic and structural issues even in reporting, um, not only just the DCR, but to the New Jersey State Police. Nevertheless, um, we made sure to include the data broken out by county and report and info on arrest, including that out of the almost 1,500 incidents reported, there were only 100 arrests. So that New Jersey residents were aware of what was occurring around them, their families and their network. We also thought it was important to have a section about the rise of bias incidents against and among youth. It was difficult to review this year because as many of us know in 2020 and possibly even still portions of today, um, you know, people are still working um, remotely. There is virtual school. Uh, there's a lot of incidents on social media, including Google classrooms that frankly just went unreported or unknown. Nonetheless, through manual review, 96 bias incidents reported in physical elementary and secondary schools with 47 additional ones in online classes and three on school on virtual platforms for a total of 146 reported incidents in elementary and secondary schools, down slightly from last year, but still up from 2018. Um, we believe, although obviously cannot, the data does not um, only consider, but again, that the virtual classrooms um, contribute to that downward slant. And then 32 incidents occurred in colleges and universities. Um, with an additional nine, again, during virtual class. And in 2020, of offenders whose age was known, 42% were 25 or under, down from 56% in 2019, and 31% were minors, down from 46% in 2019. Again, a likely result of the fact that more incidents, of incidents occurred online and less offenders were known. Let me move to the next slide. I'm gonna po possibly pass through some things. I want to just briefly explain or provided a few examples of what a reported bias incident could implicate in, from the LAD. So in a school, you see on the screen an example of some things that we actually received. Um, my, this is covered a little bit for me, there we go. So an example is two black female students stated that they're teacher told the class to quiet down after several attempts to quiet the class. The teacher directed a comment to the two black females that stated in quotation, I'm gonna send you to Africa. That explains that this is based upon their race, possibly even their gender. And a school is a setting that is a place of public accommodation, which is open to the public, which means it would be um, a bias incident um, that could be referred to DCR. Uh, another example is a student reported her teacher separates black students and white students. Teacher clapped and pointed in the student's face, unfair disciplinary action between white and black students. So that is an example and we spend a great, much more time in our youth bias task force report explaining the discipline, the disparate treatment between black and white students and frankly, students um, who are trans, students who are disabled in their disciplinary actions against students who are generally not the same race or who are not facing those types of disabilities. So again, this happened in a school setting and this would be based upon um, a, a disciplinary action between based upon the race and then seeing that feeling as if it was um, unfair and disparate and were disproportionate, excuse me. Next slide, please. So a reported bias incident that could implicate the LAD also in a public accommodation is a verbal dispute between employee, which is the offender and a customer, the victim, where racial slurs were exchanged between each other. That is a place open to the public. And you, if you experience, which unfortunately I have personally experienced in even the last six months myself, I've been places where I've experienced someone, an employee who has called me names that were racial slurs, I can and did, report that to DCR to ensure that that was accounted for and to ensure that um, there could be some action taken. Another example is an email that our director received, which is, I trust you are still with the division, Rachel. I'm reaching out because we received a phone call from a potential victim who states that she was denied the ability to get married in Ramsey due to her ethnicity. She states that the clerk would not marry her because her witness speaks only Spanish. The victim recites a pattern of behavior by the clerk that seems to target her due to her ethnicity. Would that be something your division could look into? And the answer is yes. So that can ha happen a number of ways. That victim could 
go to our website and report that to DCR and say that based upon their national origin, for example, um, they feel as if they were discriminated against. And candidly, my unit could, could identify this as a potential larger issue that is a system um, at play here since it was uh, the city of Ramsey, I believe, that might be discriminating based upon someone's ethnicity or national origin. And we could proactively investigate even if someone does not file an individual complaint. Uh, next slide, please. And then there's um, an example of reported bias incidents that could implicate the LAD in employment and housing. Uh, we received that the manager and employee victim got into a verbal altercation. The manager called the victim a, um, that word is redacted, but it is a, um, a derogatory phrase related to someone's sexual orientation. Um, because as a place of employment, you are protected and employment to not be discriminated against, to not receive hateful language. And you can and should report that not only maybe internally, but also to DCR. And then the other example is since July, the offender has made multiple statements towards the victim while he's home, such as describing him as a, um, another derogatory term that is referred to someone's national origin and telling him and his wife to go back to their countries. She has routinely um, made excessive noise in her upstairs apartment to keep up the victim and his family. So again, another example of how you are protected in housing. If you could skip past the next few slides, I think it may only be, let's move on. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up because I can feel it that I'm going over. And so I want to just again, encourage people to report to DCR. You have our website there. You have our social media at Civil Rights NJ. We have the 18333 dcr for you and the 711 relay. And um, I dropped in our QR code. So if you're watching and you hopefully can hold that up at home, I tried my best to do it and it worked for me. So hopefully on your phone, you can do that. And it'll also direct you to our website. Thank you again, Alyssa and Jay, for inviting me to talk about this really important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for the presentation, for your work, uh, for your partnership. Those are truly shocking numbers that you uh, went over. Um, and uh, given that we're a little bit shorter on time, I'm going to kick it right over to you, Reggie, um, to okay. have you give give, uh, give your, your perspectives on discrimination and bias, the work of the NAACP, and um, uh, and all the, the great the great things that you're involved in. But thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, say that my, my career covers uh, approximately four different areas. Uh, one is my involvement with uh, the Human Relations Commission. Um, when the Human Relations Commission was started in New Jersey in the late uh, 80s, uh, I was one of the first ones to serve at the state level. And then my job was to go to our local county, which is Middlesex County to set that up. And, um, and then to actually create uh, human relations commissions uh, throughout the county. Uh, the main purpose was the, uh, the increasing diversity that was taking place in New Jersey and specifically in Middlesex County, where our, our numbers of Asians and uh, Latinos uh, uh, increased significantly and uh, they were being targeted. So to kind of assist the local police in uh, handling these cases, we were able to uh, basically deputize these human relations commissions to go out and, and conduct training uh, primarily to the victims to sh share with them that they're not alone and there, there are sources out here to help protect them because many of them were sensitive to, uh, they, they'd show no interest actually filing complaints with the local police departments. So that's my involvement with the uh, Human Relations Commissions. Unfortunately, because of the way the laws have changed as far as reporting biased crimes uh, and biased incidents, uh, we no longer share the type of sensitive in information that we used to share with the human relations commissions. As a result, um, many of them have, are not as active as they used to be. Uh, moving on to the NAACP, I've been 
president of the uh, Metuchen Edison area branch for slightly over 30 years. And um, later on in my presentation, I'll go over some of the sensitive cases that we've handled over the years. Um, the other, um, my current position uh, is the, uh, I, I run the uh, bias unit for Middlesex County. Uh, you, you, you listened to uh, attorney Williams uh, talk about the statistics and all of this. Uh, for, for it to be a, a bias crime or a bias incident, there has to be an incident first and there has to be a crime first. Uh, one of the important parts of, of, of bias crime and bias incidents is that, uh, especially with uh, my department, we have to look at an incident and determine whether or not it rises to the level of a bias crime or a hate crime. Uh, these crimes are message crimes. So if we feel as if the, the perpetrator has initiated this action to, uh, to a targeted group to, to send a message, uh, that's where we come uh, get involved. Uh, these incidents that occur in the neighborhoods have to be reported by local police to our department within 24 hours. Um, and once we receive it, I, I personally, as an agent, pass it over to one of the uh, assistant prosecutors who reviews these cases and, uh, and it makes a determination if our department is going to file uh, a hate crime or a uh, or bias intimidation statute. So that's basically uh, where we're at. Uh, the statistics are incredible, um, but uh, normally my caseload runs approximately 86 to about 112 cases a year. Uh, I am already over 140. Uh, the way we're going right now, it will probably reach somewhere around 300 cases. Um, most of my cases generally come from schools. Uh, the amount of uh, issues over uh, social media. Um, it, matter of fact, sometimes we go into a school and make a presentation informing the students of the penalties of, of, of putting stuff on social media only to turn out that the, the numbers increase after we leave. So, uh, and, and one of my uh, biggest uh, areas uh, is uh, the universities. Uh, you'd be surprised how many bias incidents take place on a college campus. And, uh, and I guess a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, First Amendment freedom of speech allows you to basically say anything and everything. But, um, you know, these, these cases are reported, monitored, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, they end up as a statistic on my, my reports. Um, one of the other uh, positions that I, I had, I, um, I was, I used to do background checks for a, uh, a private firm uh, on companies, uh, uh, primarily the pharmaceutical and chemical uh, industry. So part of my presentation will be uh, to cover some of the cases that I've handled over the years. So you can turn to the next reel. Okay, I've already explained pretty much what I've done with the Human Relations Commission, so you can move, move to the next. Uh, Okay, um, with the NAACP, we started our branch of the NAACP and that's Patuch and Edison back in 1942. Uh, this came as a result of the uh, of World War II. We had a number of uh, African-American servicemen coming back to, uh, the, to New Jersey and especially to the Patuch and Edison area. And, um, and so we had to tackle issues like uh, housing uh, and also uh, jobs. Uh, many of them had applied for jobs in the, in the county, uh, in the municipalities and they were being denied. So uh, these were uh, uh, the discriminatory housing practices and segregations in schools were the issues that we tackled back then. Unfortunately, we're still kind of tackling those issues. Uh, you can turn the, uh, to the next one, okay. I'm not gonna go into the advice uh, report that was done very adequately by our first presenter, but um, I just wanted to share with you that uh, these numbers are increasing 
significantly. And um, we, uh, one of the ways that we're going to tackle it in my unit is come September, we're going to uh, present workshops uh, in the schools to uh, tell students, uh, this is what happens when you do these, uh, you know, when you get involved with, uh, you know, uh, social media with, and, and, uh, and use this as a way of, uh, of, of, of bias intimidation. So um, this way, when these incidents are reported, they can't say that they didn't know. Um, because if they're in an assembly and we have the markdown, uh, when we do the counseling, we'll, we could tell them, or they, uh, we do what in the schools, what we call a HIB report uh, to report every incident. HIB stands for harassment, intimidation, and bias. And uh, if one student reports to a teacher and they conduct a, uh, uh, an investigation, then a determination has to be made on whether they suspend the, the student, uh, whether the student goes for counseling. So, you know, these are some of the tools in the toolbox when it comes to that. Uh, you can turn the uh, page on. Um, and again, you, uh, as I said, the uh, Ms. Williams already had basically covered this. So you can turn to the next um, uh, take. Um, what, one of the, uh, when I, one of the, I was asked by a, a, a major pharmaceutical company to determine why they were losing uh, a black talent uh, over the course of years. And uh, I conducted a survey within the corporation. Uh, everybody knows this corporation, so I'm not gonna mention their name, but I, I had to interview a number of individuals who worked for the company and those who had left. And what I found was that there was pink and what I call pink and black ghettos within uh, these major corporations, uh, even though affirmative action referred to policies to, uh, to, to increase representation, uh, especially in management positions. I found that in mo most uh, corporations, uh, they would uh, train minority employees as a specialist, not as a generalist. And this is very important to know because once you're in a department, and you stay in that department and you end up supervising that department, your salary reaches a certain level that it becomes uh, as a disadvantage for you to move to another department. And uh, many of the employees were not complaining because the salaries were rising. However, they were denying themselves of getting higher level positions. So if you take a category like accounting where you have audit, you have costs, you have budget, you have general accounting, you have all these breakdowns. Uh, many of the departments were headed up by a, a minority person, but when it came to being a, uh, a CEO or a CFO, um, they didn't have the tools to, to, um, to, 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 to or the, the qualifications to be promoted in those positions, primarily because of the way that this, the structure was set up. Uh, later on, and this is just my theory, uh, how corporations got around affirmative action is that they, uh, oh, another thing before I get to that. Um, many of these were uh, multinational companies. And I found that uh, many of the departments, especially in research, was headed up by a European. And they didn't understand the concept of affirmative action. Uh, they wanted to hire basically their own individual or someone they wanted to pick. And even though uh, HR would supply them with a pool of candidates, if that candidate didn't reflect who they wanted, uh, or reflect themselves, uh, they would turn everybody down. So there was an educational process that had to kind of take uh, uh, precedent there. Also, we found that many of the managers uh, are higher level managers preferred to hire somebody who might have a graduated from the same school that they graduated from or uh, or basically um, were referred to them by let's say a co-worker so uh, you know we found areas of nepotism too so you can move on to the next and um, okay um, I'm going to rush through this so that we can leave time for questions. Um, 
the uh, yeah, the, we're, we're running short on time. This was one of our more famous cases. Um, this the state NAACP. We sued the town of Harrison because uh, what was happening? They would only hire uh, residents of of their community, and they would deny, uh, especially African Americans that um, resided in Newark. Uh, Newark didn't have that policy. If you lived in Harrison, you could work in Newark. But when it came to Harrison, you had to live in Harrison. And also we, we went after Clark. Uh, we didn't have to uh, legally go after Clark. We were able to negotiate a deal because Clark had a residential only policy for uh, municipal employees. Okay, uh, next. Okay, um, one of our most famous cases locally, um, I, uh, we had a case where 10 minority uh, transit officers came to me uh, and they were harassed, faced discrimination by New Jersey Transit. Um, we were able to uh, retain the services of Nancy Erica Smith. Some of you know her out of Montclair. She represented the 10 minority transit workers who were harassed. Uh, we won that case. They won $5.8 million. Uh, uh, New Jersey Transit paid the, all the attorney fees and the uh, the, the chief of New Jersey Transit was eventually terminated. Uh, they created the Odsman, uh, Budsman uh, to ha handle uh, discrimination complaints. Uh, funny story on this, I wanted to do a press conference on this and the, uh, the tr transit workers turned me down because they didn't want the publicity. They felt that if we did the press conference, all of their relatives would find out they'd made this money and, <laughs> and they'd be chasing them. Uh, okay, you can move the um, to the next. Okay, um, we were the NAACP was the, one of the first uh, agencies or uh, uh, to identify driving while black in the state of New Jersey. Uh, one of my first cases in the late '80s involved a uh, a, um, a student uh, from Howard University in Washington D.C. who lived in Long Island, and uh, she was driving from Long Island right after Thanksgiving, bringing her winter clothes to her college in Washington, DC. She was stopped at exit nine on the turnpike, that's New Brunswick, uh, state police uh, at, almost at midnight because she was driving late at night. Uh, just by, I want to note that she did have outer plate license plate because the car she was driving was rented. Uh, they made her get out the car, they made out to, uh, they made her, uh, empty the trunk, uh, primarily because she kept asking the officers, why did you stop me? Why did you stop me? Uh, they left her on the side of the road with her clothes off on the side uh, and, uh, and just drove away. So, um, you know, we had that case. We brought it to the Middlesex County Human uh, 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 Public Defender's Office. Uh, they too were getting complaints uh, eventually, we found out that two of the state troopers were planting drugs on motorists. Um, I have a lot more detail on that, but because of time, I'll cut that down. Let's go to the next um, one. Uh, police brutality. Um, one of the, uh, as president of the, uh, of the uh, NAACP, uh, I was asked to head up a panel to uh, look into the amount of, of, of police shootings. Uh, there were eight police shootings in Middlesex County of unarmed Black and Latinos uh, in, as, from 1988 to, um, I would say, toward the, uh, to about 1995. Uh, and um, so we were able to determine that uh, most of this had to do with training. So we were able to cut down those numbers. Actually, knock on wood, we really haven't had too many uh, of these issues as a result of the, uh, at first the training and then of course the body cams. But I did wanna mention that one side note that uh, because we had the Department of Justice come in to investigate the shooting that took place with Mr. Potts, one of the, uh, uh, one of the we had put it together a committee and I was honored to be on that committee to help uh, placed the first African-American on the uh, Superior Court 
uh, bench, and that was Travis Francis. So, okay, moving to the next. Okay, uh, one of our first cases involving uh, bullying. Uh, James Ferguson, who came from Essex County, uh, member of the North Boys Club, uh, came down, uh, uh, moved to, to Edison to attend school at Edison High School. Uh, he was bullied uh, during a period of time. Unfortunately, one of his friends, who happened to be white, supplied him with a kitchen knife, and um, he was pushed around at a uh, uh, at a dance at Edison. And eventually, the the wrestler, who was almost sixty pounds heavier than him, and, and, and at least a good uh, uh, four inches taller than he, uh, started picking on him, and which resulted in. James Ferguson stabbing and, and killing him. Uh, it's a very, it was a very controversial case. Um, they had, uh, the community had gotten together and they started putting a, um, a, a pot uh, at each of the uh, local stores saying, send the monkey to the electric chair. Uh, it, had, it had really serious racial overtones. Uh, at the time, uh, one of our attorneys happened to be Barry Albin, who now sits on the uh, New Jersey uh, Supreme Court. Uh, at the time, he was a partner at the Wolins firm who did our legal stuff as part of the NAACP. He took the case and we were able to reverse the, the charge as a minor. He was charged as an adult, but uh, we, through the appeal process, we were able to turn that. And that was the first time a, a juvenile was charged as an adult to have the court reverted back to a juvenile. You can turn to, to the next. I'm going to quickly share my screen and I'm going to try and uh, do this quickly. Um, so can everyone see my screen? Mm. Great. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about generally about data, the use of data, data to advance equity and how we at PRI use data. Um, so I'm going to begin with a quote uh, by Edwards Deming, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Now, Edward Demings developed the sampling techniques uh, that are still uh, being used by the US Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Effective policies need hard data. To address an issue, we first need to acknowledge that there is a problem, convince others to make a change. There needs to be wide acceptance. And for this, we really need good data and data, as I said before, separates facts from opinions. Use of data. So now um, with data, we get a deeper understanding. Has an issue been persistent for a long time? Is it recent? Solutions depend on the answer. We need to look for patterns. Are there ups and downs? Is it seasonal? Um, Look at geography, are particular areas more vulnerable than others? Look at demographics, populations. It helps us figure out if there is a disproportionality or it's disparity. And all this helps us in uh, identifying a problem, making an informed decision and targeting um, resources uh, better and presenting an argument for system change or for creation of new policy. So overall, it helps us improve outcomes as well as costs. Uh, data can also help us in studying the effect effectiveness of existing policies, uh, uh, effectiveness of strategies, uh, reviewing progress and mid-course correction. Uh, analysis of data also helps us understand where the data is lacking or where the data is missing. Now, um, Analyzing data to assess change. We always need to remember whenever we observe change is that change can be because there has been a real change, uh, but the change can also be because of many other underlying factors by, which one might not be aware of. And this can, um, uh, you know, this could be improvement in data collection, changes in methodology of data collection, improvements in reporting, better knowledge or awareness, uh, you know, better community outreach, for example, encouraging people to feel comfortable reporting bias incidents. So that could help in, you know, um, getting more people to report. At the same time, when there is less reporting, it doesn't mean that incidents are not happening. It's a lot of things matter when we look at data. And of course, there are social and political factors as well, or there could be a combination of uh, factors. 
presenting data. Data has to be summarized, processed, analyzed, and then finally presented. And for that, data visualization becomes really important, analyzing data to create meaningful info information and easily understandable infographics. Uh, so now, how is data interpreted? So while data analysis is really important, equally important is how are we interpreting the data? And you know there are important silent factors that need to be considered. Some of this pertains to assumptions and biases people might have. So we need to be communicating effectively because data could be misinterpreted. I mean, that might not be your intention, but people might interpret it uh, differently. So you have a responsibility when you report data. And for that purpose, where um, applicable, uh, it needs to be con uh, contextualized, giving historical, um, social, or political context. Language used should not separate or create hierarchy. Uh, for example, us versus them, you know, the othering factor that we talk about, of course, uh, you know, it should not be uh, written a way that, you know, you blame the victim. So if single moms have a high poverty rate, people should not say, oh, well, uh, you know, because you're a single mom, you will live in poverty. That does not uh, make sense. Um, and that is why it's always important to distinguish between correlation and causation, because a lot of factors could play in there. The high cost of childcare, uh, you know, you need more resources, um, you know, if you're the primary uh, caretaker and, and you have to, um, you know, uh, pay the high cost of childcare. So a lot of facets to this. Now, um, so PRI recently received, um, released a report on true poverty. And basically uh, what we did in this report was we tried to determine how much income you need to make it on your own, which means that you don't take any help from friends or family or neighbors. And um, you are also not making any trade-offs. So you're meeting all your needs. You're not going without any need. And you're also not taking any um, help from the government. And so what we did in this report was we, ta we talked about the federal poverty level and that it's an inadequate indicator of need. And it's an inadequate indicator of need, especially for a high cost state such as New Jersey, because what the FPL does is it's, uh, it's the same across the country, whether you live in Man Manhattan, whether you live in New Jersey, whether you live in Florida, it is the same. So if the cost of living is high in your state, then it's not actually reflective of, uh, of true needs. So now in this report, what we did was we tried to kind of give an example to kind of show how inadequate it is. And we took the example of um, uh, rent and we showed that you know, a three person family living in New Jersey needed at least uh, $20,598 to not be counted in poverty. The annual median gross rent is $17,316. Uh, um, so, in reality, this family would actually be using 84% of its total income just on rent and would be left with you know, just a little over $3,000 to meet all of uh, their expenses for the entire year. So obviously it's not an adequate indicator of need. Whereas the same family needed, uh, was using only 33%, 33 33.5% of its total federal poverty level income on rent in 1960, because the FPL uh, during that year was about $2,600 uh, and the gross uh, median rent was $888. So this was one way in which we tried to kind of convey that point. Uh, but you know, whenever we at PRI uh, talk about data and talk about numbers, we always put a caveat out there, which is poverty really is not a number, it's a state of deprivation which varies based on individual living circumstances. So, um, so we talk about all the extenuating circumstances. So whenever you talk about data or you talk about a number, you always have to remember that this is actually looking at the majority. It is not looking at everybody. So that's something else we like to communicate as we talk about data that while we're looking at everybody, it's still not capturing everybody because this is looking at the majority. So in this report, we looked at 300% of poverty as the real number. This is the amount you need to be self-sufficient in New Jersey, to be able to avoid deprivation. So real poverty, if you, if you have income less than 300%, you're actually living in deprivation in the state. Now, um, we also have uh, you know, some, another diagram or another kind of a graphic that we use because uh, data does not give the whole story. And so 
through this uh, graphic, we try to kind of convey uh, what the data is unable to capture. So we talk about levels of poverty, and if this is the true poverty line, and these are all the folks living in true poverty, we talk about how there's some people who are close to the poverty line and other people who are living in deep poverty who need a lot of resources to, uh, to come uh, to cross the poverty line. But the folks who are not captured in a, in a poverty number or a census statistic or a poverty report, are the folks who are living near poverty. So when the data is collected, these people are actually very close to the poverty line, but not living in poverty. So they get, kind of get missed out. So when we talk about poverty, we always have to remember that it is actually a fluid state. And some people uh, or the number might not show uh, these, these folks, but in reality, there are some people who are just a paycheck away uh, from, um, from poverty and smallest or biggest shocks can throw them into poverty. So this is kind of one of the context pieces that we use. And then something else we talk about is whenever we talk about uh, disproportionalities and disparities, we always like to kind of give that historical context, again, you know, to avoid the causation, correlation, and the blaming the victim kind of a thing. So this is some of the language we use when we talk about disproportionalities, which is basically while viewing the data, it is critical to be mindful that existing and persistent disproportionalities and disparities in true poverty are rooted in systemic, institutional, and structural barriers to economic and life opportunities. Um, now, um, I would also like to quickly talk about the PRI's upcoming report on concentrated poverty, and this is something Akhil wanted to talk, uh, wanted me to talk about. And this is also kind of another example of how we talk about data and you know just presenting data. So poverty is different from concentrated poverty. Poverty affects people on an individual level. It basically means not having enough um, um, income to meet basic needs. Whereas uh, when impoverished people live, live in neighborhoods where an overwhelming share is composed of people with low incomes, they face poverty at a whole different level because now they also have faced the neighborhood effects of poverty which is basically they don't not only have, uh, face the immediate poverty effects such as lack of access to basic necessities but concentration intensifies and perpetuates poverty itself so it has kind of an intergenerational effect and it affects you beyond your access to basic uh, needs now in this report what we did uh, what we are going to do or when it's um, released is we have used a lot of gis maps and we have kind of shown the concentrated poverty areas with the color red and uh, high poverty areas with uh, the color green. And uh, so, for example, this is northeastern New Jersey. This is how uh, it looked like in 1990. The, these areas, uh, the white areas are the uh, low poverty areas, green are the high poverty, and the red are the concentrated poverty areas. And you can see now uh, how the uh, concentration of poverty has increased. And you can see that all these areas right from here to here, you can see how uh, it's, it has spread. Um, similarly, this is another part of New Jersey, uh, you know, the Patterson Passaic areas. And you can, again, see this is all like presentation and kind of visualization where you can, I don't need to talk about it really, you can just see how concentrated poverty has increased in the state. Uh, and then you have some of the very low poverty areas, which then became, which have now become high poverty areas. Similarly, here you have all these areas which were um, not concentrated in 1990, but they are concentrated now. And then this is the Atlantic City region in 1990. And this is how concentrated poverty increased. Um, and this is the same map on a different scale. And you see similar trends um, where high poverty areas became concentrated poverty and low poverty areas became high poverty. So these are New Jersey municipalities with concentrated poverty in 1970. And these are the, say, uh, the same map of New Jersey, but now look at the number of uh, places with concentrated poverty now. So you can see that uh, uh, concentrated poverty has increased and so our main findings from the study are basically uh, that concentrated poverty in New Jersey has been consistently worsening over the five over five decades, deepening and spreading across populations and regions. 
Individuals living in concentrated poverty are disproportionately Black or African American or Hispanic or Latino. And the magnitude of concentration is lower for impoverished non-Hispanic whites. Now, some of the context that we would like to talk about kind of to give people an idea about why this is happening and the roots of this is that, um, you know, this can really be traced to earlier historical policies where African-Americans were denied access to housing subsidies that were extended to whites and real estate agents were steering whites away from black neighborhoods and black away from the white ones, redlining. Of course, there's pr uh, private discrimination. Um, and I will end with a quote from um, by Richard Rothstein in, in the book, Color of Law. Until the last quarter of the 20th century, racist, racially explicit policies of federal, state, and local governments defined where whites and African Americans should live. And as we all know, like for a middle class family, the main source of accumulating wealth is really housing. You know, when you own a home, you're able to kind of, that's, that's the way you accumulate wealth. And so now if people are denied that, it's going to have that intergenerational effect. So with that, I quickly wrapped up my presentation and happy to be uh, taking any questions if anybody has. Thank you, Shivi. That was that was phenomenal. Um, a, a lot to unpack there. And unfortunately, we are short of time, but it does just signal to me, you know, one of the the um, the, the points that you mentioned about uh, data doesn't always give the whole story. Um, so I was just curious as to your perspectives on how we um, use uh, data to further advocacy, but um, do, what mechanisms do we have at our disposal to to, to weave in to make sure that we provide the you know. Um, the perspectives uh, and try to capture as, as many as we can, because that certainly is a, is a goal for us um, to make sure that we don't leave people out um, and, and to, to represent them in our, in our advocacy. So just um, your, your thoughts on that. Shane. So I will uh, talk about, you know, there the are different types of data. You know, there's primary data, there's secondary data, there's administrative data. The primary data, what it uh, does is, you know, you, you're going out in the field yourself and collecting data. And obviously it's very expensive uh, because for, for a data to be credible, it has to be kind of, it has to fo be, uh, be following certain rules like randomized, you know, the sample sites, all kinds of things. So, so when you look at the Census Bureau data, um, that's a primary, I mean, they do the work. And so you kind of, so that's kind of credible. You could, you know, uh, especially their, uh, um, the decennial census and things like that. Uh, when you look at secondary data, uh, at that point, uh, secondary data is when we look at the Census Bureau data, that's secondary data. But when we collect the data ourselves, that's primary data. But when you look at administrative data, that's kind of reliable because you're just collecting everything that's coming to you because you're, you know, all the, uh, but then there are other things behind the scenes, like, you know, in one of the slides that I spoke about, where um, if people, if you see that the bias incidents are not very high, but in reality, you know, the situation might not be true, uh, you have to remember that, uh, like I, I know in one of the reports that you forwarded, Akhil, I uh, remember that there was something that said that, you know, you try to um, increase the community outreach and things like that, making people feel comfortable. So whenever you look at data, you just have to look at it very holistically. You have to look at everything. So you look at the numbers, you look at the trajectory over time. Whenever there's a shift, you kind of try and see, was there a shift in policy? Was there any change in policy? Was there something else happened? Was there something politically happening, socially happening? You know, like, so you just have to look for the, those indicators to kind of, and just make your assessment as you go along. You'll be able to just figure out when you just keep your eyes open and just look at everything. Okay, thank you, Shivi. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, so I just want to move to one last question, particularly for Aaron and, and Reggie, if your, your perspectives on, on this before we, we close out. I thank everybody for, for joining and, and staying on. We, we still have a great number of folks who are able to, to stay with us, um, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, my, my question is, given the, your presentation and, and incidents of bias and, and reporting, the reporting of incidents of bias are, seem to be going up dramatically. Um, sort of where the qu main question is sort of where do we go from here uh, in the sense of uh, what can we do, what can those who are, you know, on this Zoom, the folks who are in, in communities, uh, how can they get engaged and how can, how can we 
um, get us back to a place where we can see um, reduced, you know, amounts of, 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 of reported incidents, sure, but reduced actual incidents of, of bias. And then what what me what methods can we can we uh, employ as a, in terms of a takeaway? Aaron, or Reggie, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like uh, Aaron. Why don't you go first, and then I can. Sure, I will try. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is accountability. It's not lost on me that, and I don't remember because I've read so many numbers, <laughs> even though I've been living with them for a while, but you know, not many um, incidents always result in a criminal charge or a prosecution or an arrest, which I know people often um, want and desire, particularly if they're reporting mm -hmm. to law enforcement. Because remember our numbers come from New Jersey State Police and then get passed on to DCR. They were not just the ones, I was not only reporting on the numbers that came to DCR, I was reporting on the ones that went to New Jersey State Police and law enforcement. And so it was a significantly, significantly low number um, that resulted in arrest, at least based upon our time when we looked at the data, which is usually at least a year, sometimes a little longer. Um, so I think if people are not going to report or feel as if there is um, much, that can be done for them if there's no accountability. So I think that's the biggest thing I think of in my position, um, which is not immediately aligned with New Jersey State Police, but I, I, I work under the Attorney General's office and I recognize that we have to make sure that we are responding to people, that we have to ensure that people feel as if they are being heard and valued and that their experiences are um, being treated with care and that someone is being held accountable when it's appropriate to, for them to be held accountable. And that can be done, of course, in the ways that DCR can do it, again, with monetary damages, but also like specific performance. And, and there can be trainings, but I, I want more than just a training. I want a policy change. I want people to be um, reinstated in their jobs. I want to ensure that um, it's, it's, it's sometimes more than just money, although that matters too. So accountability is what comes to mind first to um, also stop behavior. Um, I think that's also what your question is speaking to. How do we change these numbers? Um, which I think it's to, it's to make sure that people know that when they behave badly, there's going to be a consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would like to, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that um, <laughs> I'm not sure that these numbers have really increased over the years. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is that um, I'm also the, a member of the uh, New Jersey uh, Bias Officers Association. Uh, we go into uh, municipal police departments and train officers on how to report, to recognize and how to report uh, bias incidents. Um, so. I'm just wondering how much of the number increase is a result of the training, the better training that our uh, police officers are receiving. Uh, I can tell you this, I've been reporting bias incidents for the last 12 years. Uh, for the first five years in my numbers, uh, very few came from the school system. Um, they weren't reporting any of their incidents to us. Now they have to. So that in itself would uh, increase the numbers. And uh, so, hey, hate is out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're dealing with neighbors that don't get along with each other. We're dealing with, um, uh, uh, you, you know, road rage. Uh, you know, we still get a uh, majority of our cases with two people fighting over a parking space and calling each other names. And uh, so, you know, it, it, uh, I don't really have an answer for that. I'd like to say I do, but uh, I think it's, it's here to stay. And one thing I have to congratulate the Division on Civil Rights and the State Police and the AG's office is that uh, they see the need to report incidents. Uh, the, the state, uh, the FBI, does not include incidents in their reporting system. So you get a, uh, a reduced or a, a flawed image of how uh, you know, discrimination is because they only really report hate crime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and, and, 
as uh, uh, as Attorney Williams has stated, you know, the amount of reported uh, hate crimes in New Jersey hovering around 100, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe for the whole year. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking for that magic pill. If I could briefly respond to Kill, I agree with you, Mr. Johnson, over all that. I don't think that our numbers necessarily correctly reflect mm -hmm. what's happening. I think yes. it's 100% an undercounting. Yes, so I agree with I you agree. that yes. the numbers that the, that I agree with you that the, that the numbers are drastically up in part because we're making reporting a priority. We're making reporting easier. We're training people like, like you just mentioned, like we're training officers and other people on how to report and how to receive reports correctly. We're trying to fix the yeah. system, right? To make it better. So I agree that those numbers are reflect, the increase is a reflection of the work that we're doing, mm -hmm. but I still adamantly say mm -hmm. That those are an absolute underreporting. Oh yeah, I agree. Happening. I agree. I think, you know, I don't want people to walk away thinking like that's those reports are wrong. I think what we should take away is it's alarming that it's such a high increase, and yet yeah. still it is significantly under what we know we experience and people are experiencing because exactly. people are learning about this still now. Yeah, because uh, one thing, if you look at numbers from the Asian community, uh, those numbers are extremely low, uh, mm -hmm. extremely low. In immigrant communities in general, people yeah. who are disabled in general, someone yes. commented that we should have closed captioning because indeed we are we are not allowing some people to be able to have access to the information exactly. to know it. So apps 1000%. Yeah. Right. When we're looking into all that, and I, I think the bottom line is we want to see these incidents drop, um, decrease, not happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we should all be working towards that and, and we are. Um, so I thank you, Aaron. Um, for all your work, for your presentation, for continued partnership and collaboration, Reggie, for all your great work. Um, you know, known you, known you for a, lo a long time, and you still <laughs> continue to put the work in. Shivy, thank you for your expertise, your wisdom, your perspectives. Uh, thank you, everybody who attended today. We're going to try to provide a, a supplement to get to many of the questions that went un unanswered. Many of them were answered through the course of the presentation, which I'm, I was uh, happy with. Um, and um, we hope to see you again at the next Justice Series. And, and thank you all again. Thanks to our presenters.